Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Susan Brown, Director of the Center for Better Bones. Today we're going to have a little bit of fun. I'm going to answer some questions that you've written in and we're going to kind of move the world's understanding about bone health just a little bit ahead. One of the first questions is about exercise. Beverly writes, I use a home gym, nano gym, and a rower. Is that enough to build bone? Walking or jumping is hard on my knees. So exercise is my favorite topic because the research I'm doing right now, it's really clear that as you build muscle, you build bone. And in fact, I'm going to speculate in the future, we're going to look at muscle mass as a very big indicator of bone mass. And so to answer your question, Beverly, you can't do impact exercises because your knees might bother you. So you have to find exercises that feel good. The rowing is fine. The home gym may work. But remember that anything that is going to build bone. So I like yoga. I like Tai Chi. I like Qi Kung. Those non-weight-bearing exercises or let's say minimal weight-bearing exercises can be very helpful too. And that's particularly because they calm the nervous system. They reduce the hormones of distress while they also put some significant impact on bone, but not as much as jumping or hopping. Do whatever exercise you can that helps to build muscle and you know you're in the right direction. And remember, the impact of exercise is site-specific. So if I lift a weight with my arm, it's going to make the arm muscle stronger. If I work with my legs, like I saw a recent study, the hip, the muscles around the hip, the adductors and the abductors, when they built the strength of these muscles, people gained bone density, and they could almost calculate how much bone density they were going to gain according to how much they strengthen those muscles. The muscle you strengthen is going to strengthen the bone that it is attached to, so pay attention to that. It's very important to remember the impact of exercise is site-specific. Okay, then there is a question about vitamin D. And again, vitamin D is like one of my favorite topics. This person writes in, this is actually Pucha Patas, writes, my levels of vitamin D are 27, and she's currently taking 2,000 units of vitamin D. My bones ache mostly and my legs have ached for months. Is this because my level of vitamin D is low and can I raise my levels? So one of the major signs of vitamin D deficiency can be this muscle ache and these bone aches. So we know that roughly a 32 level of vitamin D is necessary to protect the bones to have adequate calcium absorption. We know that at the Center for Better Bones, we want a 50 or 60 level. Your, your 27 level is too low for us. It could be affecting the muscles, I suggest. So it's pretty easy. If you're, if you're on 27 on 2,000 units, then what you do for every 1,000 units you raise, it should go up about 10 points. So if in your case, um, you're 27, we'd like 37, 47, 57. So I would do 3,000 more units of vitamin D and see how your symptoms go and then go and ask your doctor to retest the vitamin D level. In about eight weeks, you can see what that 3,000 units has done, how much it's brought your level up. Sometimes if people are very low like that, they have to take much more than 3,000. But if you don't have a doctor monitoring you, do 3,000 and then go back and get tested. And let us know if it helps your muscle pains. If not, you should look for another cause of muscle pain. You say that alkalizing, using you know our pH test kit, getting all those alkali minerals will really help. Like I'm doing the strength training at a gym now, really kind of vigorous strength training at this high-tech gym I'm going to be talking about. And they're amazed. I don't get any pain afterwards. I'll be working these machines. My muscles will be trembling, but I don't have any pain the next day, any stiffness. And that's because I'm dealing with all the acids in my body every day with all my alkalizing minerals and my alkalizing diet. So when I put a little extra load through lactic acid from exercise, it doesn't cause me any pain or stiffness. So get, take 3,000 units, retest yourself. Let's see how it goes. Another interesting question about another favorite nutrient of mine, which is vitamin K. This Paulette writes, she said, I take both MK7 and MK4. I eat plenty of green vegetables every day, so I know I don't need vitamin K. Uh, then she goes on to say that I definitely say to use MK7. So her question is, do I need to take MK4? So let's just take a few minutes or a minute and do a little primer on vitamin K. And you'll find this in my blogs, actually, because I've written a lot about vitamin K. 
vitamin K, there's several forms of it. Like one form is the produced in the plants and the chlorophyll in plant produces this vitamin K. This is K1, phenylqualanine it's called. K1 is helpful for bone. It's a very important nutrient. They have enough of it to allow for clotting. That's why babies in this country, when they're born, right away they give them an injection of vitamin K because the mothers don't have enough vitamin K and they're worried about the, that the babies are going to have a bleeding disorder. So vitamin K comes from plants, that's K1. But vitamin K2 comes from bacteria and animals that produce it. So when we talk about vitamin K2, we talk about a vitamin K that's uh, that's a longer chain of the menaquinones and it is produced by animals and bacteria. In this particular case, amongst the K2s, we're looking at MK7 and we're looking at MK4. MK7 is the form of vitamin K2 that we use at the Center for Better Bones because that form has been documented to activate the proteins necessary to keep calcium in bone and to activate the proteins necessary to keep calcium out of the arteries. It's one of the few documented ways you can prevent arterial calcification. So we always like to get K2 of MK7, a lot of research on it, done by some famous researchers, and you can find these on YouTube if you want to look them up. Dr. Vermeer is one of those. We know the effective dose is about 200 micrograms that's been shown to help halt bone loss and actually to build a stronger of bone. So here at the Center for Better Bones, we always say get 200 micrograms of MK7. Now MK4 is another type of K2. And when the J Japanese noticed that good for bone, they said, let's make a synthetic, let's make a drug. And so MK4 was used to make a drug for bone. It's sold in Japan today, and you can buy it in this country. But there's a big difference between MK4 and MK7. For example, MK7 has a very long half-life. Maybe it's four hours. MK4 has a very short half-life, and it's much less potent. So people have to take much more MK4, much, much more. MK7, you use 200 micrograms. MK4, you, the, the dose in this drug therapy is 15 milligrams three times a day, thousands of times more than the MK7. We are the food factor, MK7. Uh, the MK4, there's quite a bit of research on this to prevent fracture, and it looks very promising. We believe the MK7 is just as effective, and certainly there's a lot of good documentation on the natural food factor MK7 that these days can be made from soy or it can be made from chickpea. Most manufacturers chickpea today. So vitamin K, my favorite nutrient. Maggie writes, what are my thoughts on raw milk? You know, I think raw milk's terrific. And I remember being in the countryside following this old Ayurveda prescription that you boil the milk, you boil it first, you put a little ginger, a little honey in it, it is very delicious. It is like a, a great, you probably want to boil that milk, I'm sure it's sanitary, but I personally think raw milk is a very good idea. There's a whole discussion about homogenization and how the milk molecules, the fat molecules are made very small, it may be detrimental to the body. But in traditional cultures like India, they eat it raw, they boil it up, put a little ginger, a little honey, it's less mucus forming, tastes really good. Um, somebody asked about prolia, and, and, and they ask, are fractures prolia? Rather than adopting the natural way of maintaining osteoporosis, is the natural way more effective? So here's what happens. Prolia is one of the newer drugs drugs are developing for osteoporosis and the vast majority of these drugs try to halt bone breakdown. Prolia is one of these drugs that works different from the bisphosphonates, different from Fosamax. It actually works on another level and it affects the immune system more. But this prolia halts bone breakdown even more than Fosamax. Now the problem is whenever you halt bone breakdown a lot, what happens is you're also halting bone buildup because these two forces are coupled. And so you run the risk that the bone will become, let's say, inactive, stagnant, that it won't be able to repair itself. Every day when I walk around, if I stop, if I hop, I create little micro fractures. The body has to repair those fractures, and the way it repairs the fracture is breaking down old pieces of bone. Definitely 
want to be careful when we suppress bone breakdown so much. And the upshot of this, sure, prolia has been shown to reduce fracture, particularly amongst very high-risk people, people who have already fractured. But the problem is when the people stop this drug, 6% of the people develop spinal fractures just from taking the drug. It's like a rebound effect, and 3% develop fractures. So as always, we would say, if you can build bone naturally, if you can find out the problem behind why you're losing bone, correct that and build bone naturally. It's far superior to using these drugs that always have serious side effects. And in the case of prolia, you actually have an increased risk of fracture when you stop taking that drug. So, then this next question is about parathyroid hormone. You know, we here at the Center for Better Bones, we constantly say, to have your doctors check for secondary causes of osteoporosis. If they say, hey, your bone density is such a problem, you should take a drug, then you say, you think, well, if it's that important, if it's that big of a problem, we should look and see what the cause for this problem is. One of the common causes, well, let's not say common, two people per thousand have a situation where the parathyroid hormone gets out of control and breaks down too much bone. It's called hyperparathyroidism. The doctors can easily test for it. And just to tell you a little tad bit about that, the thyroid is, of course, in your throat, and some little glands on top of the thyroid are called parathyroid. These little glands have the job of monitoring blood calcium, making sure the blood calcium doesn't get too high. If it gets too high, they send a message, take calcium out of the blood, put it into the bones, and making sure the blood calcium doesn't get too low because both blood calcium can really be life-threatening. And so the body says, oh, the calcium's getting low. We have to break down bone. We have to get <clears throat> the kidney to absorb bone. So the parathyroid works to keep blood calcium stable. But sometimes people develop these little tumors on the parathyroid. They're generally benign, but they get the parathyroid to be too overactive. And it breaks down too much bone and it raises blood calcium too much, which can be a problem because blood calcium is a messenger for the heartbeat. For me, it's a signal for many different balances. So you need the calcium to be quite precise. So hyperparathyroidism, when you get an overactive parathyroid, generally you get high blood calcium. And that can come just from vitamin D deficiency. So if anyone's talking about hyperparathyroid, you want to make sure you're not too low in vitamin D. Why is that? You got it? If you're low in vitamin D, you aren't going to absorb calcium. The parathyroid's going to say, I need to break down bone to get more calcium in the blood. And then you can have an overactive parathyroid. It's a technical question. Endocrinologists are quite good at it, but it's one of those important components of the workup to see why you might be losing bone. A very important thing that we all insist. I want to know why. I want to know why I have this problem. Um, this, um, you know, we, we, we occasionally get a question about, uh, Marie Claire wrote about this question of combination supplements, you know, multivitamin and mineral, saying that she thought it would be better to take all, she wondered if it's better to take the vitamin and minerals separately. Well, that's a really interesting question. And you know, like in my Better Bones Builder product and in the other professional products I use, there's about 44 nutrients. And so... Some of them may have a slight interaction, like you say, calcium and magnesium. In the ideal world, if you separated them, you'd get a little tiny bit better absorption of one than the other. However, it's very impractical to imagine that you're going to separate these 44 nutrients and take them all separately. And the benefit is very marginal. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. I would say take the vitamins with your food. They're supplements with the, to the food. Take the vitamin D and the vitamin K with some food that has a little fat because it'll help with the absorption. But I wouldn't worry about a small difference in, in, um, in absorption because you take the nutrients all together. And as a matter of fact, many nutrients work synergistically together, and you really need the full array of at least these 44 nutrients to build bone. The, um, another question similar to that, was this, people frequently write, and, and Linda had wrote about this, concern with calcium. Um, some of the products I develop have 400 milligrams of calcium, some have 700, some in my office have 500. 
calcium, we always say, to us is not the center point for bone. And we have said for decades, you don't want too much calcium. Overall, about 12 grams of calcium is what's recommended for the average person. Some people may need less. I personally need a bit more. If I don't get a little bit more than that, I found I wake up at the night with leg cramps. People have different ways of metabolizing, different ways of different needs, different nutritional needs. Attention to the fact that you need all the nutrients, and so we provide all these nutrients in these supplements. What happens with calcium is people first think it's the most important thing, and it's really not the most important thing for but there has been a tendency for doctors to give very high dose calcium, like 1,500 milligrams, 2,000 milligrams. For decades, we've said that's not a great idea. When you give that amount, a certain small percentage, maybe 10% or whatever, will develop some hardening of the arteries that'll actually precipitate out that excess of calcium that they saturated the system with vitamin K, with calcium without having adequate vitamin K2, which is what prevents the arterial calcification. So we'd say if you're taking a lot of fortified, if you're worried about getting too much calcium, it usually comes from the fortified food. So, you know, take get your almond Maybe use a little bit less dairy. I wouldn't sacrifice the multivitamin and mineral. And maybe one day I'll develop a formula that doesn't have calcium. But for now, we see the vast majority of people benefit from having a certain amount of calcium to getting up to that total of 1,200 milligrams. All and uh, But you want to get all the other nutrients, so you don't want to sacrifice all the other nutrients for just to cut down the calcium. Uh, let me see here. Um, oh, this was a fun question. The other day, I, you know, we, we, we thought it'd be fun to inspire you all to have you see once in a while what I'm doing in my life. Uh, I'm just a regular person, really just enthusiastic about bone. But so I was, I was doing some golf practice. You know, I'm in upstate New York. It's very cold here, but we have a big dome where we can go hit golf balls. So I was hitting the golf balls and someone wrote and said, I golf and bowling are too risky for the spine with osteoporosis and not recommended. And and, you know, and this is Berta, and, you know, Berta, that's a really important point, and it brings us to the question that there's osteoporosis. I am a small woman. I have fairly small bones, and in my youth, I could have taken better care. So my bone density when I started this wasn't that great, and, but I always knew that I, I was physically very strong, and I do a lot of physical activity. I have a good muscle structure, and so I, I have a type of, I may have a low bone density, but I do not have weak bones, and and because I don't have weak bones, I can do golf, I can do bowling, I can do whatever, whatever I want. In fact, those of you that followed me might have noticed maybe four years back I fell off a roof, like 15 feet, right smack on my back. No problem at all. So we want to judge what our situation is. Just because they've told you your bone density is minus 2.5, that really doesn't mean that your bones are not strong and you can't golf and you can't bowl. Obviously, if you have a if you fractured, you know you really do have osteoporosis. If you find that you have certain pains, generally your muscles are going to tell you long before your limits than the bone will tell you in everyday activity. You know, falling down is a different thing, but in everyday golf, so in other words, there's types of osteoporosis. If I have a low bone density, I have strong bones. And we're encouraging all of you, particularly thin women, to realize small bone women, you can have very strong bones and still get a low bone density reading. And I guarantee you all, all of the better bones follow. One day, bone density test will not be used to diagnose osteoporosis because you cannot predict who's going to fracture by bone density. Hey, it's been a lot of fun. Take care. Keep sending your questions, and we'll do this again soon.